Welcome back, everybody, to track one. We are about to start our next talk on this track, which is called A Transition to Remote, Managing the Present and Imagining the Future. It's going to be delivered by Professor Prithvira Chaudhary, who is an associate professor at the Harvard Business School. And it will be moderated by Dr. Annie Koshi, an educator with more than 30 years of experience. Dr. Koshi is a member of the State Advisory Council Delhi that advises the state on implementation of the provisions of the Right of Children to Free and Compulsory Education Act. She is also a trustee of the Pratham Delhi Education Initiative and a member of the Departmental Advisory Board Department of Education of Groups with Special Needs, NCART. Dr. Koshi received her doctoral degree on the discourse of education, re-examining the concept of inclusion via a study of the narratives of school children and the Indian state. Her undergraduate degrees are from Delhi Sri Ram College and the Central Institute of Education, University of Delhi. She has a master's in English literature from Delhi University and also in educational management from Oxford Brooks, UK. Welcome to the conference, Dr. Koshi. It's wonderful to have you here. I know that you're having some lightning problems uh, with your internet, but hopefully that's been fixed. And we all look forward to having you moderate this session with Professor Chaudhary. Over to you. Thank you, Ali. Well, if MHRD can have problems with the net, I think um, we're all forgiven for all that. Um, the session uh, now, a transition to remote managing the present and imagining the future is next. And we have Prithviraj Chaudhary, who is um, uh, the Lumri uh, uh, Family Associate Professor at the Harvard Business School. Um, Prithviraj, um, as far as um, since uh, Ali has done so much about um, qualifications with me, should tell you uh, for all of us principals is true blue chip comes from IIT, IIM, and then on to Howard, and um, is now associate professor, the associate uh, at the Howard Business School. Uh, interestingly, his work is on something uh, which I for the first time heard, the geography of work. And um, he's going to actually look at uh, this transition that is staring all of us in the face, that of moving from the old to the new, the online, and what does it mean about this geography, geographical mobility, immobility or flexibility? Prithviraj, so lovely to have you. Thank you so much. And we look forward to listening to you. Thank you, Dr. Koshi. Uh, so let me just share my screen. Uh, thank you again. Th uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, so I'm not a school uh, educationist. I don't study schools, but I've been doing research on remote work for several years now. Uh, so maybe what I'll do is in the first 15 odd minutes, I'll just show you some research findings, uh, uh, you know, from what I've been uh, working on. And this is my research with companies, of course. And these companies are in some cases, extremely large companies that are thinking about remote work. Uh, but there are also a few of, uh, of, of these companies which are really, really cutting edge in terms of how they're thinking about remote work. Uh, so I'll share some of those uh, you know, findings and best practices. And then what I'll do in the, in the, in the later part of the talk is just try to imagine uh, you know, how we could learn from, from these lessons in a, in a school system and what the future of school education using remote might be. Uh, but you are the experts, I, I want to say, uh, on, 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 on how to run schools. So I also want to learn from your questions and your thoughts. Uh, so with that, uh, let me jump in. So what I've been studying is this phenomena called work from anywhere. Work from anywhere is a relatively recent remote work phenomena. And the companies practicing this, uh, uh, this uh, remote work practice are typically smaller companies such as Akamai and Zapier and GitLab. Uh, but there's also versions of this work practice in uh, NASA, 
in the US Department of Agriculture and the US Patent Office, which I studied in a lot of detail. Uh, there are a uh, large company such as Dell, which has also done this. So Dell actually went majority remote this year. And this is all well before the pandemic. So this phenomena is not something that is just starting with the pandemic. Uh, but there is a lot of skepticism also if you talk to the global leaders in business. So Marissa Myers at Yahoo very famously, some of you might remember, pulled back her entire company into the office saying, we need to have face-to-face, -face, we need to have these, uh, uh, these water cooler discussions for innovation. And then IBM more quietly did the same in 2017. They stopped uh, 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 remote work and said, everyone, please come back and let's get physically congregated in one location. Uh, one thing I want to uh, uh, say is that work from anywhere is conceptually very different from work from home. So work from home is what we are all experiencing now. Uh, where And work from home has been around for many, many uh, years, even decades. And in a work from home model, you are working from home like this woman that Nicholas Bloom in a Stanford paper is depicting. But you'd also go to this office once a week or maybe twice a week. So you have that physical association with the office. In work from anywhere, which is something I study, uh, and the patent office, the US patent office practiced, you now let people live anywhere. So you don't have to be in Delhi or Bombay and be close to the office. You can go and live in a small town in Madhya Pradesh or West Bengal or Orissa and work for the company. So it is the flexibility to live anywhere. And why would people want to live anywhere? Lots of reasons, to save uh, cost of living, to be close to your parents, Maybe there's a dual career situation that makes this easier, so on and so forth. Uh, and that is what uh, Dr. Uh, Annie was talking about. In, in my research, I talk about geographic flexibility, the, the flexibility to live anywhere. And the first thing that happens to an, any organization which does geographic flexibility is you save a ton of real estate costs. And that is extremely uh, interesting and important if the company or the organization is in say Mumbai, or uh, in, in Tokyo or, or in Silicon Valley or a very high real estate uh, cost location. What I found with a very rigorous study, which I don't have time to get into, but the paper is on my webpage, is that in the US patent uh, office, this practice, work from anywhere, also led to a higher productivity to the order of 4.4%. So, and this is uh, productivity of patent examiners who were doing more with their, their examinations. We also found that people moved to cheaper to live locations. And there were other benefits such as older work workers moving to more sunshine in places like Florida. Uh, now, of course, what we are experiencing now with uh, this forced working from home is not anything like what you would do uh, with, with remote work under quote unquote normal circumstances. So I've looked at that also and the data and the evidence is very preliminary. Uh, so in the Chinese context, very quickly, what I find is that, of course, the productivity goes down. There's a dip in productivity. Uh, and I find that people are working um, longer hours with this forced working from home experiment. And when I discuss this with uh, you know people, people generally agree that that's been their experience too. Uh, so what might happen beyond this COVID-19 shock? So one thing, uh, you know, one project I'm really excited about to and I'm working with, uh, with TCS. Uh, and TCS is trying to move four point, uh, out of its 4.5 lakh workers, 75% of these workers to a work from anywhere model by 2025. So that's something I'm studying. And of course, uh, the reason I mention this is, you know, TCS is not a startup. It's not only dealing with a few thousand people. So there are lots of implementation challenges to this. Uh, and what you know, we'll find collectively will be very helpful for other large organizations trying to do the same. Now, I promise that I'll bring this back to the classroom and the school. So let me uh, share some insights from one particular case study I've written recently, and this is a company called GitLab. So GitLab is a 1300 person organization and they have been remote from day one. So they, they've been all remote from day one. So they don't have any physical offices. Everyone works, including the CEO and the entire C-suite works from home all over the world. So what are some of these lessons from GitLab which might be uh, helpful for us in this present crisis to manage the present? Uh, 
So this case is, uh, is once again on my webpage, you can find it easily, but let me share a couple of insights from that case. So the first thing uh, you know, I, I found very striking in that setting is how they use asynchronous communication. Uh, and many of you probably already know what I'm talking about here, but in a traditional school environment, when you are always talking to students face to face and there is discussion in the classroom, that's wonderful. That's what we do at HBS too. But just given this forced working from home, a lot of the communication and the delivery of material, uh, and it's not only delivery from the teacher to the student, but from the student to the teacher could also be using asynchronous uh, forms. And uh, this is just one of the Slack channels from GitLab, and maybe some of the schools are already using Slack. Now, the, the benefit of asynchronous is uh, it cuts through time zones, and that's not a big concern for schools in India, I understand. But the other thing that I'm finding in my research is, if you post a question and let people uh, react to it asynchronously, so you don't have to do it real time, face to face, it often uh, leads uh, students, or maybe I've not studied students, but I've seen employees to be more thoughtful. So maybe there's more deep introspection in what people, uh, you know, how they conduct their research or their thinking before they respond. Uh, so I would urge you to think about asynchronous communication channels. GitLab also does something fascinating, which is to codify all the knowledge in the organization in a handbook. And this handbook is not written by one person sitting at the top. This is a crowdsourced handbook. So maybe each class or each subject can have its own handbook where the teacher writes some parts, some students write some part, and maybe this can be across the classes. Uh, so not only for one class, so maybe class five, six, seven, eight, and people uh, are crowdsourcing to this handbook and it almost becomes your own internal cod codification of the knowledge about that subject inside the school. And if you, if you wanna know how to do this handbook, it's not easy to do because, you know, as human beings, we. We like discussing, we like problem solving, we don't like documentation, but it is critical to an all remote operation. And maybe this codification of the handbook is one idea you can try out or pilot out in the immediate present. Uh, the other thing that GitLab does, which is extremely important, and I'm, no, I, I'm sure you are doing it too, but is this focus on virtual water coolers because we are all stressed, we're not feeling socialized, we're missing seeing each other. So we can do all of that virtually. And here I would say the only constraint to what we can do is our own creativity. So I was, I was speaking to someone in India and in her company, they're doing virtual water coolers to help us, uh, kids with their homework. They're doing virtual DJ sessions. So you could really, and, and if you're dealing with school children, I'm sure they can have their own creative ideas of how to set up these virtual water coolers. So those were three specific ideas for managing the present, uh, the virtual water coolers, the use of asynchronous communication channels such as Slack, which gives people time to think, and then the codification of the ideas for a class or for a subject using this crowdsourced handbook. So the handbook, once again, is not written by the teacher. It's written by the teacher, the students, the students across sections, the students across grades, and becomes a living document. Now, imagining the future, I'll just say two things and then I'll stop and then we can, we can go to the discussion part of the talk. Uh, what could a future with work from anywhere look like for schools? So as I was thinking about the topic, I thought about two things. Uh, maybe we can find or schools can find teachers everywhere. So I'll just uh, mention one specific example that I'm uh, more knowledgeable about. So I've been working with the Niti Aayog on return migration of talent uh, to these Indian uh, education institutions, but primarily colleges and universities. And as part of that research, I, I, I've uh, come across these initiatives. So I'll, I'll mention one of the initiatives uh, that might be um, uh, you know, uh, something that we can think about collectively, even for schools. It's called Gyan, and some of you might know this. Uh, it was uh, piloted by IIT Kharagpur. And what they did was they brought these really, really globally reputed uh, teachers, not uh, researchers, teachers, down to these Indian institutions for a week or two weeks. And what then happened was, of course, the person delivers the content when he or she is here in person in India. But then what if we just extended that, that train of thought? And imagine now 
uh, a world class teacher and of course you are all you know india has uh, just an amazing human capital base for teachers but if someone is working on something uh, say on a machine learning or artificial intelligence in in mit a postdoc or a or 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 a professor and if that person is spending a week in india and if he or she then spends that week with school children uh, building that face to face communication imparting some knowledge but what if then the person goes back and then continues that relationship with the school students uh, over a zoom uh, a classroom so maybe you can find teachers everywhere uh, and i know of some startups and companies in china that are doing this they're bringing this crop of world class teachers into india the other thing i would say is that just given the 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 great human capital we have in indian teachers uh, maybe work from anywhere as it gets more accepted as a model could help indian teachers reach out to global students so i would i would feel uh, you know i i feel that uh, finding teachers everywhere can be a two way uh, uh, process the 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 last thing i'll i'll say is that you work with uh, very talented students but there are very talented students who are not as fortunate to come to your schools so one project that i've been studying for the past two and a half years is the csrl project i've been working very closely with csrl and many of you uh, might know them they are the center for social responsibility and leadership and they have set up all these super 30s not the patnas super 30 on which the movie was made uh, but these are really really interesting super 30s and the model is they always do it in partnership with some uh, psu state owned entity such as the indian army or uh, gale or indian oil and ongc and so on and they do it in very remote places uh, so they have about 30 su- uh, these of these super 30s and two of them are in kashmir and i specifically studied the kashmiri students and the girls in kashmir actually had to be brought to delhi and they are taught in this indian oil super 30 in delhi but what i found in that in that research is they are really really only working with the tip of the talent iceberg in kashmir there are so many more students who are who are left out uh, and I, i don't know if kashmir is, a, is 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 the motivating example but that is true all over india there are so many talented students who are outside the purview of this excellent uh, education system that all of you rep- represent and i wonder whether uh there could be some student everywhere models where you find these students and everyone has a mobile phone and and create these sort of interactions between these students and the teachers in your schools or students in your schools to create an educational system that also caters to this periphery uh so i think that is where i'll stop um and you know once again you are the experts in running schools I hope my ideas of working on remote work models with companies was helpful and I'm also here to learn from your questions so I'll I'll pass it to Dr Annie uh, and then I, I look forward to the discussion thank you a uh, great prithviraj that um, uh, definitely gave us some um, uh, ideas from uh, from the area that you researching Uh, i was just thinking when i was listening to you that you know work as defined uh, by you was seems to be largely uh, the teachers you know the flexibility the mobility of teachers uh, but if uh, education is not the fun that it's supposed to be and largely given the kind of examination system we have children would largely say it's not much fun it's work how would you sort of apply this concept of um, geography work of geography uh, or the geography of work to students and you know them attending school uh, from wherever or whichever school that they want how would you sort of put your ideas on to that idea it's a very interesting uh, a thought uh, uh, dr goshi and you know i think uh, just given how new this phenomena is uh, you know i i feel it is just at the at the at, at the stage of nascency right now and it it requires all our creativity but as i said uh, the first thought that came to my mind was that india has such a wonderful uh, uh, school uh, uh, you know educational system but it only caters uh, to the core in my mind right and there's a huge periphery out there which is which is for all kinds of reasons excluded from this wonderful education so what if uh the the schools that all of you represent individually or collectively create a platform where now these 
kids from Kashmir and Manipur and rural uh, Kerala and rural West Bengal can also participate in some sort of discourse uh, and pedagogy with you guys? Uh, and what if your students can also engage in that process? So it becomes really a community, uh, a platform for uh, these peripheral students to learn from you, for your students to learn from their experiences. Um, and I just feel that, you know, if you, if you take out geography as a constraint, so what I'm trying to do through my research is to say, where you live is not a constraint. So if you just make that assumption, and now with Zoom and Skype and all these other communication uh, tools that we have, what if we created really a vibrant community where where you live is not a constraint? And what will be those specific business models for Indian schools? I think that's a longer discussion. And honestly, you are the experts embedded in that, in that reality. So I'm sure you will do a much better job than me articulating what those business models might look like. Yeah, I think um, uh, Dr. Koshi was having some yeah. internet issues even earlier. So I think we'll wait for her to come back with Viraj. But I think that was just another very interesting take on, on the issue. And uh, you very interestingly redefined work from anywhere as separate from being work from home, which which itself is, while we're still adjusting to work from home, uh, this, this was a very interesting take on what work from anywhere is going to mean. Uh, now, you know, there are questions that people have about... Uh, Someone has a pretty meta question on what if we never go back to normal? What if there is no normal? And uh, I'm not really sure how you can address that in this context, but would you have a take on that? So I, uh, you know, from my, uh, you know, vantage point, uh, I, I, I see a new normal emerging and I'm really excited about this work from anywhere normal because it has many, many implications just beyond where people live and work. Yeah. Um, so, so many of us have been forced to move to these really expensive cities to work. And that's yes. not only true in India, that's true globally. Uh, so Silicon Valley, for instance, is just the real estate and the cost of living is exorbitant there. Yeah. Uh, in a work from anywhere model, and it's already happening. I, I, I've been studying this in the context of Tulsa, Oklahoma, right. where uh, a foundation started this remote project about three years back. And they are attracting these remote workers back to this really small town in the middle of America from the coasts. And many of these workers actually coming are teachers. Uh, so I should have mentioned that. And the benefit is these, uh, these uh, people moving to these smaller towns uh, can now raise their families with a bigger house and the, the cost of living is much cheaper. But then it reverses the brain drain that we have seen for decades from small towns to large cities and then from you know, our country to the US or the West so we could now uh, potentially have a reversal of the brain drain. We could now have people coming back to where their homes are. Uh, and that could have huge uh, implications for both the hubs, but also the periphery. Yeah. Uh, yeah, reverse brain drain is very interesting. Uh, we've always been used to a unidirectional brain drain uh, in this country, at least. Of which you, of course, are an example. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that... Uh, uh, People are concerned with at this point. Ah, I think Annie Ma'am is back. Welcome Sorry. back, Koshi. I'll see I'm myself so out. It's, there was a storm in Delhi and some of the electricity seems to be coming and going. Uh, you know, Prithviraj, I was just thinking about uh, the fact that since outcomes are so important in um, in education, you know, um, how, uh, how would we actually... Uh, you know, when you talk about the fact that you know, we could sort of uh, come together, we could crowdsource, uh, we could teach from anywhere, children could attend from everywhere. I mean, you know, you say that where you are should not, uh, you know, be your, um, uh, your ticket to an education. But in India, what you are, the color of your skin, you know, your caste, your creed, everything defines your opportunity to education. And since online has shown, as our previous speakers also said, the great divide that is there and the class system of education and how when all of us talk about um, online, we sort of forget that. So how would you actually uh, think, you know, off, off the cuff about this whole issue of children who can't actually access online 
And how would this geography of work help them if you had to sort of apply your mind to that? What would you, what would be your suggestions? Yeah, so no, I think that's a good question. And I don't have any easy solutions right now, but online access is, is critical for uh, working from anywhere or living anywhere to work. And, um, you know, the assumption I'm making is that now with a mobile phone, uh, many people compared to 10 years back have that access. Now, there still might be uh, kids and students who are excluded from that access, but I think there is enough to work with. Uh, and so I, I feel it is, it is the, the question is how do we pilot this, this uh, say for instance, if the idea is to create a, a community or a crowdsource portal where students are, your students are not only graded on how they do in exams, but how they codify knowledge. How do you create an open sourced physics portal where the ideas that have been taught in your schools traditionally for, for decades are now codified? And these experiments are sort of codified and it becomes a living document. And then how is that uh, portal or, or community shared with students in the periphery? And how, how do your students, the, the students in the school, then reach out to these kids living in rural Manipur, learn from their day-to-day -day lives and, and, and their talent and their ideas, and how does it become a pan-India? And that's just one idea that I, I, I thought about, but I'm sure uh, there are many ideas that can be piloted. Uh, the, the only conceptual point I really wanted to stress again is uh, work from anywhere or live anywhere really cuts through the constraint of where people live. So if there is a, there is a really, really good uh, rowing coach somewhere in the world and someone wants to learn those techniques, then instead of bringing him or her down to Delhi or Calcutta, you could get on Zoom and learn those techniques now, right? So I, I feel that is the, the, sh the paradigm shift in thinking that I'm trying to sort of get across. So there are a lot of questions about your water cooler. You know, I mean, how do we actually uh, do these virtual water coolers? And it's connected, I presume, to the emotional uh, strength of the employees. Uh, so um, uh, they would really like you to elaborate a little bit more on how the virtual water coolers would work and what should the employer really keep in mind when, you know, uh, sort of doing that. Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I feel first, you know, uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, sort of reiterate why we need virtual water coolers. And we especially need them right now, uh, just given the stress and the, the emotional sort of uh, issues that we are all dealing with uh, and the, the lack of life and family balance. But the reason we need a virtual water cooler is many of the conversations that happen in the physical world happen around these serendipitous interactions where you might be sitting in the staff room or you might be passing each other in the corridor and then someone says something and the other person learns something serendipitously. And now that is the opportunity that uh, these all remote organizations do not have. So instead what they have done is they've created these virtual water coolers and how do you set up one? Um, there are two or three principles. One, you shouldn't force anyone to join one because no one forces anyone to join a serendipitous conversation in the staff room or the corridor. So this should be something that people can self-select. Uh, typically, they don't have a topic. Uh, typically, these are sessions where anyone can join and talk about anything. Uh, so it might be, how was your weekend? You know, how are you dealing with, with uh, you know, kids during this, uh, this lockdown? Uh, sometimes they are programmed. So I've, I've seen examples where people are saying, let's do one on Friday where we are now getting a DJ or let's do one focused on yoga. Uh, but there has to also be a lot of informality, right? Uh, the other thing is it, it really helps. Uh, so one thing that the virtual water coolers can do, which the physical water coolers can't do, is to cut through the hierarchy of the organization. So it's very hard for the principal to socially interact with every teacher or every student every week. But the principal can join a virtual water cooler and speak to like 100 people at the same time. Uh, but the guiding principle there is uh, you really have to let your hair down. You cannot have those formal, uh, you know, people need to have, so quoting my uh, colleague, Amy Edmondson's work, there has to be a lot of psychological safety in these water coolers. So people should be able to uh, speak their mind. It should not be treated as one more company meeting or school meeting. Uh, and I think that is the culture that percolates from the top. So if the principal or the vice principal joins these sessions once a while, 
and really creates that that psychological safety, I feel people can then get really creative uh, around these virtual water coolers. And then students can have their own virtual water coolers. Uh, they can be virtual water coolers that, that connect different grades, if that's relevant. Uh, they can be thematic uh, water coolers around hobbies, interests. But once again, they should be um, not forced on people uh, and they should be relatively unstructured and there should be a lot of psychological safety for people to speak up and talk freely uh, as they would do in the corridor or the staff room. Yeah, thank you. Um, you did say that in your research, you found that working remote, remotely uh, was productive in the USA and not so productive in China. Can you sort of expand on your idea of productivity? I mean, how did you sort of, you know, uh, define productivity uh, when you said it was good in yeah. USA and not so much in China? So let me clarify. So what I said was that uh, I found an increase in productivity, and I'll define that in a minute, in the US Patent Office. And this was for their work from anywhere program. And what I found in China was in the immediate aftermath of the uh, COVID-19 lockdown, when people were forced to work from home, their productivity went down. And the distinction is important because what we are experiencing now is a forced working from home. This is not remote work under normal circumstances. So, and everyone's productivity is getting hurt. So that is what I'm finding in the Chinese study. And the US Patent Office is, uh, that that study was done. So I did it three years back, but the data was from 2012 and 2013. So there was no pandemic, there was nothing. It was working from anywhere under normal circumstances. But to your specific question of how we measured productivity in that circumstance, uh, it's very easy to do it in the patent office because you can see how many patents people examine every week. So it's very measurable. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. very measurable. Yeah. But if you are doing the same analysis in your schools, uh, you need to be more creative, right? It just cannot be test scores. I would say, how many entries have you made to the online handbook? That can be a measure, which is very objective. Uh, but you need to make it very measurable and objective and fair. Yes, uh, I mean, that was what I was thinking about when you spoke about productivity, you know, because um, I mean, uh, education is this, you know, such a such a sort of, um, you know, fine gossamer kind of cloth, which, you know, the, the weft and waft is hardly defined. And um, it's online teaching, as you say, was forced on all of us. I mean, we had four hours notice, you know, to actually get up and start running. And um, uh, we were all sort of building the ship as we sail. And uh, so um, what we have found as teachers is that when we work from home, there doesn't seem to be any definition of working hours, you know, I mean, you will call for meetings. How so? How, what would your advice be of, uh, you know, about uh, working hours and how do we actually um, get that correct? No, that's a that's an excellent question. And that is a, a challenge that these all remote companies have really, really taken head on. And the way they have done so if uh, if you, if you think about Zapier or uh, uh, GitLab, which are all remote, so they, are, they, are, they don't have physical offices. They, they are always working from home all over the world. The additional problem is they have to work across time zones. Uh, and so the problem is more acute for them. So there might be someone in the middle time zone who has to stay up till midnight every day. And so they have really regulated that in two ways. One, they have given freedom to the employee to choose her working hours. So there is no mandated nine to five or 10 to six. It is work when it, it, it is good for you. They provide a lot of coaching for people not to work constantly. They provide individual coaching to people where there are yoga trainers and other therapists who would ensure that you, you are setting alarms to get up from your chair or you're setting alarms to go for a walk or you're not working over the weekends. And if they see that your work hours are exceeding some normal uh, because they track that, they will send you an email saying, hey, what's going on? You need to slow down. Uh, and the third thing they do is, uh, why do we have these meetings at 8, 8 p.m.? Sometimes they are to discuss very trivial things that could be discussed on a Slack channel. 
and maybe the principal can post uh, his or her question and then the teachers don't have to react that night. They could wake up tomorrow, the next morning and react to it. So what these all remote companies have done is they have scaled down these face-to-face -face Zoom calls. They have very few face-to-face -face Zoom calls. And actually most of their communication happens on Slack channels where people are not reacting face-to-face. -face. Uh, and that has taken out a lot of their unnecessary meetings that happen late at night. So what you're saying is that both employer and employee has to recognize the particular culture and respect uh, the individuality. And, you know, I mean, if I'm the kind of head that just wants to shoot my you know, head off in, uh, at a different time and that doesn't work, I can call someone on a one-to-one -one and still uh, be a pain, you know. So definitely it requires a certain uh, personality and um, um, could you tell us, uh, since your research is through with uh, CSRL and Gyan, how um, this online and uh, working from, not from home, but working, you know, with this uh, geographical uh, freedom, how did that actually impact the success of uh, the Super 30s? So they have not embraced uh, remote working. They are doing it right now, just like all of us. Uh, but in their model, the constraint has been, uh, the biggest constraint which I feel uh, working from anywhere can solve is that if you find a very talented student in Manipur, they do not have a center in Manipur. Uh, they tried to open one, but they had to close it down. Uh, mm -hmm. So these Manipur boys were moved to Delhi. Or if you find a very talented uh, girl student in Kashmir, they do not have a center for girls in Kashmir. So the girls all have to come to Delhi. And there are many families and many students who do not want to do that. They do not want to leave Manipur or leave Delhi. So they are left behind. So that is the constraint. So, and the thinking I was uh, doing on myself reflectively yesterday was what if they did not have to come to Delhi? What if they did not, if they could stay in Manipur or Kashmir, but participate in a super 30 curriculum from there. And so, would that increase the number of students that Super 30s could reach out to? And would that same prin principle apply to the schools that all of you lead? Could you reach out to students who do not have a place to live in Delhi? Or even if you provided some hostel, they're not psychologically safe to come to Delhi. Uh, and could you provide them with some world-class content uh, while they live in Kashmir or Manipur or uh, very remote places? Uh, well, uh, we have homes in Delhi. We, when I'm saying the government and individuals who run homes for children of the street, um, they have had difficulty in accessing online classes. Sometimes they don't have the instrument. Sometimes they don't have the connection. And um, um, we ourselves have a school in Madhya Pradesh, Orcha. And when we tried to we found that actually... Um, uh, they don't have the phones and then we said okay audio karte hai. and then they said ma'am par hamara charge khatam ho raha hai wo paise bhej do charge ke liye so uh, uh, i mean uh, definitely there's much to be done from the government side also before we can uh, move into this whole thing uh, uh, your children i think are very young uh, prithviraj right Yes, so uh, uh, would you sort of recommend to them, uh, would you recommend for them an online class? Uh, what, what kind of classes would you like to get for them if you are thinking of this uh, freedom of geography? No, I think it should definitely be for their generation. It should be uh, one of the options in the, in the, in the, in the toolkit. Uh, I don't think it can be the only, so I, I, uh, you know, we were discussing this yesterday. I feel students learn a lot from co-location, being congregated. There's a lot of social uh, and emotional learning that happens in those settings. There's a lot of reflective learning that happens in those settings. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that all that be replaced. Uh, but I'm saying this could be an additional toolkit. So, uh, you know, if my, uh, I have two boys, uh, my elder son is 11 and a half. And what if, you know, in a summer, I take him to India hypothetically, and maybe I'll try this. And he finds a great teacher on, on some ancient Indian, uh, say, the Ramayana or Mahabharata, which he should learn. And then continues that relationship online, uh, even after he comes back to the United States. I think that that definitely should be an option, right? And so what if our teachers could impart the learnings 
that we've had for not only uh, years, but decades and centuries to the entire diaspora spread out, spread out all over the world. Um, what if, uh, you know, my, my, my kids, uh, uh, you know, develop some interest in robotics and there's a professor in Berkeley and, you know, I, I introduced my son to him and he, um, you know, just spends one hour every uh, month uh, just inspiring these kids, right? Uh, so I feel, you know, uh, learning has been constrained by geography. And maybe if we take out geography from that, that set of constraints, uh, they can be, uh, you know, much richer knowledge flows across these boundaries that are completely artificial in today's Zoom age or Skype age. And, and Katkoshi, I just want to react to the internet connectivity problem. I totally agree with you. And why I brought that up is if Indian oil or ONGC is spending lakhs and lakhs of uh, rupees for these Kashmiri girls to come to Delhi and live in their hostels and learn, they could spend the same money giving SIM cards or data plans to kids in Kashmir so that they can live there and, and, and learn the content. So I feel there is money, there is sponsorship already available. It just needs to be redirected in a different way. Oh, yeah, I think that's a brilliant idea because actually uh, learning within a cultural milieu, learning within a context is, 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 a, is a very essential part of learning. You know, we learn from our peers, we learn through reflection and reflection in Kashmir will definitely be different from reflection in a more, you know, hi-fi uh, Delhi place and where you're disconnected from your culture and uh, things like that. So, um, uh, could you just uh, tell me your thoughts about how assessment, you know, um, uh, uh, you've gone through the CBSC system, I think, and you know that it's a very content-based um, assessment pattern. So, uh, when you look at online teaching and uh, teachers, say, assessing from across the globe, uh, what do you think would be the areas that they would assess? And, you know, cheating is a big thing in India. You should not be cheating. And um, when we tried uh, doing assessments during this uh, COVID times, it was everyone come on to screen, you know, we are watching you, you know, and we'll give you your test then and there. So, I mean, we are so caught up in this no cheating scenario and how do we, and that testing content all the time. But That's education... Sorry to interrupt, but uh, we are down to the last one minute. Yes, so, thank we you. will shut there. Um, so um, I think we didn't hear the bell. And um, uh, so will you quickly answer that so that we can no, move no, on? So to that, the uh, in 30 seconds, uh, you know, the, the final thought I have is our evaluation. So first of all, I went to the West Bengal board, which was very rigorous. <laughs> so and it was entirely rote learning and a lot of test taking. I feel the model that I, the final thought I'll leave with the community is, what if uh, the evaluation can be done by the peers? So today, if I'm a software engineer, uh, my evaluation is actually done by peers on forums such as GitHub uh, or others, Stack Overflow, where I get badges from people. So if the learning is transformed from a test-taking system to a community-based system where the peers can actually evaluate other peers based on the ideas they post in these online, online portals, that might be a way to sort of uh, break down this test-taking focus that we have yes. in many cases. Definitely a time to sort of reimagine ourselves. Thank you so much, Prithira. That has been so wonderful. And um, I hope we are well within time. Thank you, everyone. On to the next, uh, next session. Thank you, Prithviraj. And thank you, Dr. Koshi. I think that was just enthralling. In fact, now, I think it's pretty clear that this conference needed to be at least a week long because uh, each one of us, I think, wants to hear each one of you for at least three or four hours. It's just fascinating the kind of issues you've brought out, Prithviraj and ma'am, through your questions. Thank you very much. That was an absolutely fantastic session.